Hello everyone, and welcome to another installment of From Pixels to Pictures, the show where we take a look at film adaptations of video games and try to figure out what went wrong. This is episode number 13, and oh boy, is this an unlucky day for us. Previously on this show, I talked about the Resident Evil series and how they coined the term survival horror. But while those games might have popularized the name, the actual concept of survival horror predates the RE franchise and goes back to a little game series known as Alone in the Dark. While not as popular as Resident Evil, Alone in the Dark was super influential in helping those games become what they became. But even outside of that, the games still hold up to this day. The game I played for research was the fourth one, The New Nightmare for PS1, and I have to say I was really pleasantly surprised by it. This game has interesting lore, fun puzzles, and an absolutely killer atmosphere, really immersing you in the horror experience, maybe even a little better than some of the RE games. Now, unlike some of the games I've looked at for this show, Alone in the Dark had very real potential to be adapted into a great movie. But that's not what happened. The film version of Alone in the Dark was released in 2005, in January, always a good sign, it starred Christian Slater, Tara Reid, and Stephen Dorff, and it was directed by the one and only Uwe Boll. Yeah, get used to him, we're going to be seeing a lot more of him in the future. Now, in this show, I usually try my best to spread positivity, and I try to be as fair to the movies as I can. But it is incredibly hard to be positive when talking about this movie. Not only is it considered the worst Uwe Boll movie, not only is it considered the worst video game adaptation, but it is often included on lists of the worst films ever made. And if you clicked on this video thinking that maybe I would be the outlier and defend the movie, well, I'm sorry to disappoint. The critics are right, this movie is awful. And so I'm going to lay my cards on the table. This video is probably going to be shorter than the other videos in this series, and the reason for that is it's honestly difficult to muster up the energy to talk about this movie. As someone who cares about their mental health, the less time I devote to thinking about this movie, the better. So, let's not waste any time. Actually, scratch that. We are about to waste a lot of time talking about this movie, but screw it, somebody's got to do this job. So... How did a genuinely fun and frightening horror game get utterly mutilated when it made the transition from pixels to pictures? Round 1. Characters. In the game, there are two playable characters, Edward Carnby and Aileen Sedrak, and the game differs greatly depending on who you choose to play as. For my playthrough, I chose Edward because I knew going in that he would be the main focus of the film. Edward in the game is not exactly a super complex character, but he's very straight and to the point, and has some nice floaty banter with Aileen throughout the game. I will say this, I remember playing the game and being aware of the fact that Christian Slater would be playing this role in the movie, and I remember thinking, oh, I see that. Slater has proven in the past that he has talent and a certain level of charisma, and I thought he wasn't necessarily a bad choice for the character on paper. However, his character is changed quite a bit for the movie. In the game, he has no knowledge of the supernatural world before the events of the story, while in the film, he's a paranormal investigator and knows about the Abkhani from the start. The explanation for this is his changed backstory. He was chased down by the government as a kid and had some kind of encounter with a monster that isn't really explained. I guess they're trying to make the character more interesting, and if it led to any kind of emotional stakes for the character, then maybe it would work, but clearly this isn't that kind of movie. I'll say this about Christian Slater, this is about as good a performance as it is possible to give when you're being directed by Uwe Boll. Which is not great, but still kind of admirable. 
As for the other lead character, Aileen Sedrak, she's played by Tara Reid. And if you look up any of the reviews for this film, one of the main talking points is the miscasting of Reed in this role. Oh, she's just a blonde bimbo, but you put a pair of glasses on her and we're supposed to believe she's a scientist. And if I can play devil's advocate for a moment here, I think people might be going a little too far. Scientists come in all shapes and sizes, and the one smart decision the filmmakers make here is not having her recite a bunch of sciencey mumbo jumbo that she clearly wouldn't be able to do. This is not a good performance, but the fact that so much of the criticisms were targeting her specifically feels a little unfair to me. She is far from the biggest problem in this movie. When it comes to the character herself, sadly there's not much there. She shoots a gun a few times, and thankfully she's not reduced to damsel in distress mode, but she's not really doing anything useful either. They do try to give her a connection with Edward, but the chemistry just wasn't there. And don't get me wrong, the chemistry they had in the games wasn't much, but it was something, and Aileen had a personal connection to the case that gave her character a lot more emotional weight than in the movie. Edward and Aileen are the only characters from the game to make an appearance in the movie, which is Fine, I guess. Unfortunately, the new characters aren't memorable at all. Stephen Dorff plays Richard Burke, who is kind of the rival slash foil to Carnby, but I never fully bought it. Dorff and Slater feel like the kind of actors that would have frequently competed for each other's roles. They both have a very similar energy to them, and because of that, nothing about Burke stood out as a character other than he doesn't like Carnby. As for everyone else, well... Frank C. Turner plays Sam Fisher. He's an older guy who helps Carnby, but there's not much to say about him. It's a pretty stock role and a bland performance. And the same can be said about Matthew Walker, playing the very basic villain Professor Hudgens. No, not Professor Hitchens, though Lord knows that would be more entertaining. And that's kind of it. Now, the game, outside of including a substantial amount of backstory for the Morton family, also includes Eden Shaw, a Native American character who is a descendant of the Abcanis tribe and serves as a guide to Edward and Aileen. Now, because the movie makes a big deal early on about the importance of the Abkani tribe... Sorry, I missed the S. Um... I initially assumed that there was going to be some kind of stand-in for Eden Shaw in the film, some Native American character to represent everything the tribe stands for. I even braced myself for a white actor doing a really bad portrayal of a Native American. But that character never shows up in the movie, and the end result is the film treats the Abkhani like an alien race. They're nothing more than a plot convenience that a bunch of white characters can exploit. So, yeah. In conclusion, the characters in this movie are not likable or interesting, and they're brought to life by uninspired acting. But what should I expect from an Uwe Boll film? I'm almost surprised that they kept the names Edward Carnby and Aileen Sedrak, and that they look kind of similar to what we saw in the game. But it doesn't add up to that much in the grand scheme of things, which is why I'm giving it a 2. Round 2. Setting. I want to start off by saying that the first Alone in the Dark game, despite being revolutionary for its time, has not aged terribly well in terms of graphics. But by the time A New Nightmare came around, they had figured out how to make environments that look and feel genuinely scary. The game is just dripping with gothic atmosphere, and part of why it works is because it utilizes the dark and the light in a really effective way that leaves you never quite sure if you're in a safe environment. Even though the game is clearly taking some inspiration from Resident Evil, I don't mind because it works really well as a standalone experience. And one place where it deviates from R.E. is the final act, which takes place in this hellish, supernatural, dark world that is just all kinds of creepy. But when it comes to the movie version of Alone in the Dark, you know what? I think I can sum up everything that's wrong with this movie in three words. It's not dark. The majority of this movie takes place during the day, which is your first major problem right there. It's so ridiculous, because early in the film, they have Edward monologue about your right to be afraid of the dark. Bad things lurk in the dark. And then shortly afterwards, we get this scene where he thinks he's being followed, but any tension is immediately ruined because it's bright daylight. 
Later on, when there are monsters attacking the characters, the film fails to utilize darkness in the most basic of ways. I think these creatures are supposed to work the same as they did in the game, where they thrive off of the dark but can be harmed by light, but somebody forgot to tell them that because they start making the lights flicker. Why would you make the lights flicker when you could just shut the power off instead? It makes no sense. Now that's not to say you can't do horror in bright daylight, because other directors have proven it's possible, but utilizing darkness is like the number one trick to doing effective horror, and you have the perfect excuse to do it. You have dark in the title, and you have monsters that thrive off of the dark. I mean, it's practically gift-wrapped for you, and you're not taking advantage of it? On its own, the production design of this movie is passable for what it is. I really wish we had gotten to see the spooky mansion from the game come to life in a movie, but that's more of a story issue than a setting issue. Even the cinematography is competent enough. There are some nice looking shots, like the one near the end where Professor Hudgens is on the hill and the monsters come down. I guess it just really bothers me that they don't do more with light and darkness. In the last act of the movie, we see the characters go into the mines. Theoretically, this should feel closer to the game, but by this point in the film, I had already mentally checked out, and I was so ready for this to be over. But then, at the very end, when they open up the portal to the dark world, and we see this... Let me tell you, when this moment happened in the film, I leaned forward in my seat with my mouth agape. I couldn't believe I was actually seeing something that kind of looked like the game. It wasn't super accurate, but it was the first time in the movie where I actually felt like I was seeing something from the game come to life in live action. And it's only on screen for a minute. You guys may remember, in the Resident Evil review, I said it felt like a tease to start the movie in the house and then we don't get to see much of it. But in that movie, I don't think it was actually done on purpose. I don't think the filmmakers were actively trying to be mean to the audience. Here, I think Uwe Boll knew exactly what he was doing. I think Boll wanted to show us that he knows what Alone in the Dark is supposed to be by recreating the environment that the final act of the game took place in and then taking that away from us. As someone who played the game and really enjoyed it, this moment felt like Bull was reaching out of the screen and smacking me in the face. The movie was not doing a good job up until that point, but that was the final nail in the coffin for me, and in this category, I cannot in good conscience give it anything more than a 1. Round 3. Story. Ugh. You have no idea how tempting it is for me to just say, it's bad, and leave it at that. But I have a job to do. After watching the movie, I came across an article that referred to the film as a quote-unquote sequel to the game Alone in the Dark, A New Nightmare. I forget where exactly I saw this, and everything else just calls the film an adaptation. I can tell you that when I was watching the film, it never even crossed my mind that this was supposed to be a sequel, so if that was the intention, it failed. I guess you could argue that this interpretation explains why Edward and Aileen know each other and why Edward knows so much about the supernatural, but even if you want to use that logic, it still doesn't add up because the film gives Edward a completely different backstory and the Abcanis becomes the Abcani, so really it just makes sense to call it its own continuity. The story of the game, on the surface, is very simple and to the point. But they do incorporate a lot of backstory about the Morton family, the Abcanis, and all the experiments that happened in the past. And the game asks you to pay attention to all of this information because you need it to solve the puzzles. It feels like it was all thought out and pre-planned, so I have to give them credit for that. It's not the best story in the world, but it's a solid foundation for the filmmakers to go off of. But... Uwe Boll being Uwe Boll, he decided to completely ignore the perfectly good foundation that the game provided and come up with something different. Even if you want to argue that the game's story is full of cliches, Boll's story is filled with entirely different cliches and worse cliches. The first draft of the screenplay was written by a guy named Blair Erickson, and from what I can tell, the script was going to stick much closer to the game, and he was not too pleased about the changes that Boll made. I can't say I blame him. The only thing that they kept was 
there was a Native American tribe that was important, and there are some white people who are obsessed with them and are messing with things they shouldn't mess with. Also, there's a cool agent named Edward Carnby and a hot scientist named Alien Cedric, and that's basically it. There's things from the game that are in the movie, but in terms of the actual storytelling, it's very, very different, and every single change is for the worse. For instance, the game takes place over the course of one night, uh, and the tension constantly feels real, and it builds and builds throughout the story. In the film, we keep intercutting it with daytime scenes where you know nobody's going to get attacked, and it hurts any sense of momentum and tension that this movie could have had. Edward and Aileen are now exes with no sense of chemistry. Uh, full disclosure, the version of the movie I watched had the sex scene removed. I'm guessing it was censored for television. I'm shocked that someone went through the trouble of editing this movie down for TV without just saying, screw it, can we cut every scene? The movie has a habit of not explaining many things, but over-explaining things that the audience already gets. And it also has a habit of jumping around between scenes very quickly rather than giving a scene time to breathe. When I started writing this script, I was shocked at how little I had to say when I came to this round. Actually trying to talk about the story, or lack thereof, in this movie is an obscenely difficult task. The script doesn't make me care about the characters or the stakes, it doesn't even make me afraid of the monsters. The exposition is lazy, the ending makes absolutely no sense and comes completely out of nowhere, and the story just gives me no reason to care about it whatsoever. I feel like I said absolutely nothing in this round, and I apologize, but you try doing a deep dive into the story of this movie. Actually, don't. It's not worth your time. I'm giving it a 1. Round 4. Experience. The original Alone in the Dark game, released in 1992, was considered a pioneer in the world of horror games. It walked so that Resident Evil could run. By the time A New Nightmare came out, it was pretty clear that this game was taking direct inspiration from Resident Evil, but again, it's done well, and it manages to stand on its own as a really good horror game. But since the games are so synonymous with RE, I guess it only figures that the movie should follow suit. Heck, I imagine the only reason this movie was greenlit was because of how successful the RE film franchise was becoming. And one thing that this movie definitely bars from those films is it wants to be an action movie and not a horror movie. Except, it's not even a competent action movie. Most of this film is just people sitting around and talking, and the action that is in the film is very muddled and confused, with dizzying editing that just makes the whole thing feel incoherent. The horror elements are even weaker, with the aforementioned lack of darkness and stakes that never felt quite real to me. And this is all coming from a guy who doesn't usually get into horror films, but if you're gonna do it, do it right. You've got a great horror game you're adapting. The title is literally Alone in the Dark, and you've got a legitimately creepy poster. I like this poster. And yet, despite all of that, the only scary thing in the movie is that one scene where the doctor is taking the worm out of the person's spine, and that's more gross than anything else. The effects in this movie are just awful. The monsters are very uninspired CG creations, a lot of the gore is very obviously fake, the blood is too bright a shade of red to be realistic blood. There's mistakes in this film that everyone's already pointed out, like the gunshot that misses this extra's head by a mile even though it was clearly added in post-production, or this scene where a character who just died very clearly moves their head. This is the type of thing I would expect to see in the Goes Wrong show, only there it would be much more entertaining. But with all that being said, there is one thing in this movie that is actually good and kinda close to the game, and that is the score. Uh, the score was composed by four different people, and it sounds good, and kind of similar to what is heard in the background of the game. It's not a great score to be sure, but it is a good one, far too good for this movie. I don't know what happened here, maybe the composers pulled a fast one on Bowl and tried to sneak in something of quality into this picture. You know, for a movie that is often considered one of the worst films ever made, I feel like I don't have anything to say about it. And I'm not alone either. The reviews I found for the film are very straightforward about how bad it is. No one wants to do a deep dive to analyze the terribleness, no one wants to rant and rave about it. 
Everyone agrees that it's bad, but no one is that angry at it because it's hard to feel any kind of emotion over this film. There are different kinds of bad movies. How do you categorize them? For me, it comes down to the director's intent. Most bad movies are made by directors who clearly didn't care what they were making and just wanted to make money. Or maybe the director wanted to make a good movie but had no idea how, and the end result is actually entertaining because of it. Then again, sometimes the director is deliberately trolling an audience by trying to make them feel as uncomfortable as possible because they have a sick sense of humor. Perhaps worst of all is when they're trying to push a message, but it's a message that's actively harmful and discriminatory. So where does Uwe Boll fit into all this? Well, if you're familiar with the story of the producers, that's essentially what Uwe Boll was trying to do. It's been well documented at this point that Uwe Boll deliberately took advantage of German tax loopholes that allowed him to make a profit on movies that bombed at the box office. There's multiple videos you can look into that goes into this in more detail, but I have no doubt that Boll was trying to make a bad movie on purpose. And the funny thing is, what he accomplished is kind of impressive. Think about it. If you asked most directors to make a bad movie intentionally, they would probably make something entertaining in spite of themselves. It would either be laughably incompetent, or it would be full-on batshit crazy. But Uwe Boll walks the fine line very well to the point where this movie never becomes entertaining to watch, even on an ironic level. The movie starts off kind of in the so bad it's good category, but after a while it just gets so boring and you simply could not care any less about what you are watching. It takes effort to make a movie this bad on purpose, especially when the source material is so promising on paper. The game is good and I feel like it doesn't get the credit it deserves. When most people think of the title Alone in the Dark, they think of the movie because it's so infamously bad. Interestingly, the fifth game in the series was supposed to come out around the same time as the movie as like a tie-in feature, but the game ended up getting delayed three years because they wanted to distance themselves from the movie as much as they possibly could. That should tell you everything you need to know. I wonder if someone will ever remake Alone in the Dark. Probably not, they're too busy remaking movies that were actually good the first time, but if it ever happens I'd certainly be interested it couldn't possibly be any worse than the original. I'm giving it a 1. Now you'll notice I've given out a lot of 1s in this video. Personally, I don't believe in a score of 0 out of 10. I think there's always something positive that you can latch on to about a film. But essentially, the way my rating system works, the absolute lowest a movie can score is 4 out of 40. And this movie gets a 5. I essentially gave it one point, and trust me, that's being generous. That adds up to 12% for a final score of F. Worse than House of the Dead, worse than Mortal Kombat Annihilation, heck, even Super Mario Bros. ranks higher as an adaptation than this does. Think about that. <sighs> well, if there is a silver lining to all this, it's that we have seen the very bottom of the barrel, and we can only go up from here. And I have to remark on the irony that the next movie bears the title Doom, and yet it fills me with so much hope. Alright Rock, I'm ready to have a good time again.